Hello, everybody. My name is Doug Shelley. I'm the VP of Product Development at uh, Tesora. Um, we're here today to do an introduction of Trove and uh, demonstrate a multi-database deployment with it. Um, and to help me do that, I'd like to introduce Michael Baznight. He was the former PTL of the Trove project and is a core member. So uh, take it away, Michael. Thank you. So uh, just to give you guys a little bit of history, I've been working with Trove since we started it at Rackspace a few years ago. Um, I've been, you know, before we were incubated acting PTL uh, the entire time, and I just recently stepped down. Another uh, fellow uh, from HP, Slick Nick, is now the, the PTL. Um, so we're, today we're gonna talk about, first, what Trove is, give you a little intro, and uh, then Doug's gonna go into how to install it, a look at the API, and the uh, demo. So we all know what traditional database management looks like. It looks a little like this, right? You've got all these different things, all these different data stores, and there's, everyone has their own scripts that they've written to, to run their infrastructure, and, and you, you have a set of users that are going to be doing a ton of these as well, and you have a lot of automation built in, and what Trove is is we, we want to build a system that takes all of this spaghetti and turns it into a nice API for users to use and for operators to deal with. So what exactly is Trove? First and foremost, it's an API and implementation for data, database, data store management in the cloud. So it, it, it also automates admin tasks. So Trove in its, in its heart is exactly what you'd think you'd want from not having to deal with a database, right? You just want to fire it off, forget it. You want to make sure it runs. You want to make sure it stays running. You want to make sure you can upgrade it, resize it, um, you know, scale it, uh, deal with a high availability, multi-tenancy, um, and efficiency of resources. You don't want to have to worry about bad neighbor effects. You don't want to have to deal with someone else clobbering your data store in a multi-tenancy environment. So, we leverage OpenStack, of course. So we, we use OpenStack as kind of a black box. You don't have to, you don't have to run your own infrastructure. You can, you can stand up Trove if you want and talk to an existing OpenStack infrastructure. You can run it all yourselves. So we use Nova to do you know, all of the actual compute. Uh, if you choose to use Cinder for block storage, you can, you, uh, can set up volumes that way and put your data there. Um, Neutron for networking. And uh, we, we also use Swift for backups uh, to dump, you know, dump uh, a MySQL uh, dump or what, some other backup to Swift so customers can then get it out if they want to, but also for long-term uh, storage and retention. And Glance for the images. Uh, the, you know, we have a custom image that typically already has a specific data store uh, installed on it, so you don't have to really manage that at all either. It's got a fully functional REST API and, and a dedicated guest agent. So in dealing with OpenStack as a black box, we can't really put uh, something on a compute host, right, to manage uh, a set of 100, uh, 100 data stores. So we've got a small guest agent that sits within each virtual uh, machine, and we talk to the guest, and the guest does all the communication to the database, the health checks, making sure you know, we're still online, does the resizes, create users, and all of those, all of that spaghetti stuff we talked about. So it's also designed with pluggability. When we started, we were MySQL. Uh, we, we built the system so that we could be anything SQL or no SQL. So as we've, as we've grown for the last uh, six months to a year, we went from literally MySQL to MySQL, Couchbase, um, Redis, Cassandra, Mongo, am I missing any? Uh, Percona MySQL. Uh, so, so we have a generic API for your users to spin up all kinds of different data stores and then we manage them for you. So a little bit about the architecture. Um, so as you can see, like I said, the, that everything other than the, the guest agent in red is OpenStack, and we, you know, we view that as a black box. So the Trove API is in charge of you know, sending, the user sends a message to Trove API, uh, the REST API, and 
it, it then talks to the task manager, which is kind of the brains of the system right now. Uh, the task manager instruments things like backups, pushes things to Swift, talks to Nova to then go, you know, to first create the instance, all of that, you know, standard stuff for building, installing, and securing a data store. And so we also have the concept of a conductor, and that's in charge of uh, heartbeat messages and making sure that that uh, your instance stays online. And then you can see inside that compute instance, we've got this little guest agent. And so the guest agent is, it's mostly a dumb agent, and the task manager's in charge of telling it what to do, but it actually does, it'll run the commands that that data store knows. So when you go create a user, right, it will run SQL for you to do that, or it will, um, you know, edit configuration files to, uh, to change something about your data store that you want to uh, persist down in the instance. Um, and then everything else is standard OpenStack um, circles. So it's really more than just a VM, right? We, we spin up your instance for you. We'll create a replica. We can resize, you know, all of the standard things that Y'all have all seen a million times for every data store that you have ever dealt with or used. You know, add users in databases, manage grants, uh, database backups. Earlier we were talking about uh, building scheduled backups at the design summit, so scheduled backups and maintenance windows so you can, you know, have uh, automatic minor version upgrades uh, as well as, you know, something if we need to bounce your uh, VM, we, you, you can determine when we do that. Um, and uh, another, another feature that was added in IceHouse is changing the database configuration. So you can do, do more things that are customized for your instance without having to have a user actually get on the instance and do it. So you pass, uh, you pass you know, what you want to change in the default configuration files, and then we manage that for you, restart your instance if you, that needs to happen as well. Um, you know, we, we're, we do our best to enhance the user experience. I mean, one of the questions we asked ourselves in the beginning was why be limited in how you interact with the database? Um, we want to make the experience as easy as possible because managing databases is not an easy, fun task. So when we sat back to design this, we wanted to make it a click and forget service almost, right? You fire it off and you know that your data store is gonna be up and running and it's gonna stay running and if we need to add replicas to it or if you want to add replicas or you wanna resize it or you know, grow your data set, you have all the ability to do that from a nice easy REST API and you don't have to deal with how the heck do I actually you know, edit these configuration files? I have to instrument you know, restarting the master and then the slaves, and then I have to wait for the slaves to catch up. All of that stuff you don't have to deal with anymore. You just say, do this, Trove. So we, the first thing we do when we install an instance is we secure it. Um, there's a few steps that you need to do typically with data stores that you just you know, install from uh, your package management. And so we've decided that we're gonna do our best to remove some of the, um, you know, the funky things that are installed by default. Uh, and you know, we, we, based on the, the things that you choose, such as the flavor and the disk size, we create an appropriate configuration for your data store. So we know that when it fires up, it'll be running as best as it can based on the resources that you have uh, allocated for it. And another big thing that we uh, design by default is no SSH. Your user shouldn't have to manage any tasks whatsoever by getting into a machine and doing something. That should be all over the API. Now, of course, there's gonna be things in a particular data store, like, I'll take the example of adding users because we've been uh, arguing a little bit over whether that should be core into the API or not. So, you know, you have, like, your data store can do things better than what an API can do for you in some cases. So, you still have full access to your data store. You can do the things you need to do. You can, you can run, you know, MySQL dump across the network and get your, get a copy of your data, uh, database back in your local data center if you want, right? We're not doing anything special there. We spin up your data store and let you do things to it. We just don't want any users getting into the machine. So we're, all the things that require physical access, we do for you. So Trove has been 
integrated since Icehouse. We've been working on it for about two years at Rackspace, and we've had a vision of it for a while. I mean, a lot of people have been working on data stores, databases as a service. There's you know, a bunch of companies that are doing this. So we have a lot of prior art and knowledge about what people want with a data store. So some of these features are short to medium term, and some of them are kind of the vision of Trove. Right, so fully managed replication and clustering. Uh, we expect to have an experimental clustering API and uh, replication in the Juno timeframe. Uh, we've got some great guys at Tesoro working on that right now, as well as some people from eBay uh, with the clusters. Um, Auto-scaling replicas, that may be a little bit further out, uh, just because we've got to finalize um, building the replication and clustering API. Uh, automated failover, if your node goes down at 3 a.m., you don't want to have to deal with your pager duty call or you know, waking someone up from the operations team, and you definitely don't want, as a customer to this, your stuff to go down and then you have to do some action in the API. So automated failover and automated recovery is, is part of the vision of Trove. We want to grow it so that it is smart enough to know that if a slave goes down, you know, you can grab a backup, you can resync it, and you can continue moving. Um, and cross AZ uh, region availability. There's, there's no requirement right now, since we're a black box to OpenStack, that we can't talk to more than one OpenStack installation uh, in a single, uh, like let's say at Rackspace or at HP, or you can't have a replica at HP of a instance that you're running at Rackspace. We wanna build this so that it's, it's easy for you to kind of plug pieces in where you want your uh, data to be so you can make it closer to your, uh, to your application rather than just clicking and hoping that you don't have a terrible latency. Um, and, you know, the building block for every OpenStack service. So, you know, at, at, since, uh, since we started dealing with Trove, we kind of joked a lot about, you know, it would be really great to have the inception factor, right, where Trove manages Nova's database, even though Trove needs Nova in order to create those instances. So, you know, we've talked a lot with the bare metal guys about finding ways to install Trove from the ground up so we can, you know, kind of be the, the, the underlying infrastructure as well as a customer-facing infrastructure so that, you know, you can use the API, but it also makes installing OpenStack easier as well. So, thank you, and Doug's gonna take it over from here. Thanks a lot, Baz. So, I wanted to drill into some more of the details. So I want to start with just this quick, uh, what some of the concepts are so that we have those kind of grounded before we go through the install and uh, API. So basically, uh, Michael touched on some of this. The, 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 one of the root concepts is a data store. So this is basically an abstraction of kind of the underlying database. And as he mentioned, originally it was just MySQL, but now there's implementations for Mongo, Percona, Couchbase, Cassandra, Redis, MySQL, Percona. Um, the other concept that goes kind of along with that is the database version. So the thing that's material about this is that, so obviously databases have many versions, so an operator can basically you know, create MySQL, and then as versions are rolled out, uh, they can basically create new data store versions in Trove. And it also provides, this is where the linkage is provided to the um, guest image that, that Michael mentioned in his uh, presentation. So the guest images are in Glance, and they're basically linked at this level to this data store version concept. Um, there's also this configuration group. So this is basically a way that you can take database-specific parameters and kind of manage them. So for example, and I'll get into this in more detail, you can say you want to change the max connections on a MySQL instance to 500 or something. That would be a parameter that's inside a configuration group, and you can apply this to multiple instances and manage, it, uh, manage the group across multiple instances. There's also the concept of a flavor. I mean, flavor is basically the same as in Nova, except this gives you the opportunity to create flavors that are specific to Trove, so you can optimize particular parameters for your database. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so, how does Trove install and set up into, um, into OpenStack? So here's the building blocks, the black box that Michael talked about in terms of the Trove installation. You have your controller node and your compute node, and then these services are running. So, so basically, the Trove installation, the obvious way to do it is you apt-get or rpm, and it basically will drop right into your controller node. So that's, that blue box is the left side, the red side of the architecture slide that uh, Michael had. Okay, go ahead. 
So configuration, there's a few things here. So in general, configuration is like many OpenStack services. There's some configuration files to edit. But the, one of the major parts of the configuration is you need is basically the creation of these guest images. So there's a guest image for each data store version. So you'd have one for, say, MySQL 5.5. And that lives inside of Glance. So after you have that, you basically can start creating Trove instances. And this would be an actual running database. So for example, you'll see this in my demo. I'm going to make one called A MySQL. So this is basically in the compute node, a Nova instance with the guest agent running in it and MySQL. And then, for example, I'm also going to show how simultaneously you can have a Mongo instance running. So a Nova instance with Mongo and a guest agent. OK. Before I show you kind of the demo, I want to just run through some of the uh, command line interface um, uh, commands, API. So for configuration, some of the other things you need to do, you know, you, we need to tell Keystone about Trove. So there's some commands that basically you create a tenant in Keystone user service. You need to create an endpoint in Keystone. So that's Keystone endpoint create. And the last thing there is basically when you create this guest image, then you use Trove manage command to put it into the glance and associate it with a data store version. So in this case, you have a, you'd have a um, MySQL 5.5 image, and this command would associate that image in glance to the data store version MySQL 5.5. OK, so from a usage point of view, so we're, we're past configuration. Everything's running, and now we actually want to use Trove. So these would be in user land. So for example, a uh, command line interface, you can do Trove data, database, data store list, sorry, and data store version list. These would actually list what uh, databases and what database versions you can actually create instances from. And then you can create an instance using Trove create, and you basically need to specify a name for your instance, what flavor you want. And there's other parameters, like I want it to be data store MySQL version 5.5. Um, to list your instances, there's Trove List, which I believe is pretty similar to all the rest of OpenStack <laughs> services. Um, and Trove Show gives you more details. OK, uh, we'll go through this too. So if you want to create a new configuration group, so this would be a database-specific set of parameters, you do Trove Configuration Create. And you can specify a name for that group and then the set of the dictionary of values that you want to actually apply to that group. Um, and then there's a way you attach it to an instance. Oh, oh, actually, just rolled. Sorry back. about that. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, thank you. You can uh, use Trove Configuration Attach to attach the configuration you just created to an instance. And the other thing that's very interesting about configuration groups is say you have 100 instances and you attach the same configuration group to all 100 instances, you can then actually patch that configuration group and cause a change of a configuration value to go to all 100 instances simultaneously. And I'll show some of that. OK, we talked about backups. So here's how you create a backup. So you do Trove Backup Create, and uh, you refer to the instance you want to back up, and it'll back it up. Currently, the backups are basically point in time manual. As Michael mentioned, we are in the process of talking about scheduled tasks and having backups be able to be scheduled. You could do an incremental backup if you specify the parent, command, uh, the parent uh, switch on the Trove Backup Create. You can list backups. You can show more details of them. And then restore. So I have this in my demo. Basically, you create a new Trove instance, refer to a backup, and it'll bring that up with the backup lit up in it so that when you go to the database, it's got all the data that was in the backup. OK? OK. Now well, the fun part. Now the fun part. So I, I took some advice from Baz. When I told him I was going to do a live demo, I think he said, you're crazy. Because all sorts <laughs> of stuff happens at conferences that will screw up your demo. So I actually took his advice and made a little video that I'm going to talk through. I can find it here. Oh, wait a minute. OK. So I guess I set the resolution incorrectly. <laughs> so, the, um, so I'm going to go into Horizon for a little bit here and show you some of the things. So we're going to start. So I sign into Horizon. Is that going? Yep. And then basically what this is is your standard Horizon screen. So if you notice, you may have noticed this already. I think that's been in Horizon since. Havana, right, the database yeah. uh, under project. There's a databases section. So if you go in there, oh, wait, sorry. And you click on, is it running? No. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I was asked if I could make it bigger. It, so there will be portions of this that will zoom in, OK? So basically, here we are. 
we're going to launch an instance, okay? So I clicked on launch instance, this screen pops up. Um, so basically, I'm gonna fill in some of these things, the database name, the flavor, the volume, and the data store I want. So that should go here, here we go. Watch how fast I can type. Oh, you told me to do that? Like this. <laughs> so there I created a, that's something to point out. I created a flavor ahead of the, running the demo called dbass.m1.tiny that had some specific sizing and memory and CPU requirements for this, for this particular data store. So I'm gonna pick MySQL. I get the MySQL 5.5 version. And I'm gonna go ahead and actually, on the second tab, actually create a, databa a, a database in the MySQL instance. Yes? Yeah, that's a very good question. So he's asking, are we assuming the Trove is installed? Yes, I didn't, the demonstration started at the point that I had done all the configuration, installation configuration. Yep, and we, we are working on better docs. We have some documentation for how to install Trove, um, and we're, we're glad to help in any way, shape, or form, especially Doug. And actually, that's a very good point for me to insert plug, right? <laughs> so Tesora, the, uh, yes, uh, Wednesday announced the availability of a, our database as a service platform. So what we've actually done at this point is um, packaged up uh, in, uh, the installation of Trove and automated the configuration, and we're actually providing guest images for download available so that you can actually get from zero to 60 rapidly. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled demo. So. Um, right, I'm creating a database, and I'm going to add a user to it so I can connect to it. And here we go, launch. And then it shows up in the horizon uh, list, and now I'm going to go ahead and actually create another instance simultaneously. I'm going to make a Mongo instance. And that's not actually how fast they install. Yeah, of course it is. Well, that's in the Tesora version. <laughs> oh, that's okay, well, done. I can't speak to that. <laughs> so you'll see Mongo pop up here. So there, there they are. Uh, and they're in build state. You can see that. They're going to go to active here like that. Look at how fast that is. Wow. <laughs> so now I'm going to go ahead and drill into the details of one of these. So this is equivalent to a Trove uh, show. So let me just stop there. So this is a, the show command gives you all this information. Clearly, the most important thing on here is the connect info, so that y the connect URL you'd use to actually connect to this instance now that it's running. So this is the Mongo, a show on the Mongo instance. And we'll just keep going here. Come on, mouse. Probably should have cut that part out. <laughs> okay, we're gonna uh, drill into the MySQL, we're gonna do a Trove show on the MySQL instance. So there you can see same information, you got the, it shows you how to connect via MySQL with that URL. We're gonna look at some of the other info for MySQL, so there's my user that I created. Um, and the database should show up on here. I think that performance scheme is showing up as actually an open bug. <laughs> and now we're going to flip out to the CLI, because I know how much everybody loves command line interface. So here we are. Hopefully you can see that. So I'm going to connect to the MySQL instance I created. I should be able to type faster than that. And what I'm going to do is we're going to take a look at um, one of the uh, uh, MySQL specific variable called max connections. So it's defaulted to 100 when you install MySQL. So it's at 100 right now. I think I decided to do a show databases so you could see the database in there. What I'm going to do is create a configuration group that includes the adjustment of that parameter and apply it to the instance and show you what happens. So I do a so trove list so I can get the instance uh, UUID to refer to in the configuration command. So I did configuration list, which shows that at this moment there are no configuration groups created. Now I'm gonna run a trove configuration create, and I'm gonna create a configuration group called myconf1 that includes setting the my, uh, max connections to 500. Now I'm gonna attach this, uh, I'm gonna do a list again so I can get the UUID. <laughs> so basically the configuration attach command, I take the ID of the group and the ID of the instance, associate them together, and then we'll go check out MySQL and see if it actually worked. I wonder if it worked, I don't know. <laughs> I should have actually put something not working in the demo because that's the only way you know it's a real demo, I think. <laughs> so 
so here we are. So there's a configuration attach grouped, grouped to instance. Now we should be able to go immediately into MySQL. I just showed the, 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 that Trove configuration instances is a command that you can use to show that the config, what configuration group is associated with an instance. So we're back in MySQL, it's 500. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, patch it. I'm actually gonna change it from 500 to 300 and show that it did that on the fly as well. So in this particular case, there's only one instance, you know, so it's interesting, right? But you can imagine that you could have attached this configuration group to 100 instances, and then you can go do this, which changes the group. It immediately would push that out to all 500 instances, or whatever I said, 100 instances. So we're gonna go back into MySQL. It's now 300. No applause? No. <laughs> So I think what we're gonna do now is um, I'm gonna load some data into this database, mostly so that when I back it up and restore it, you actually believe that the backup actually worked. <laughs> so I just have this uh, schema we use for some testing of some stuff. So I'm just gonna show you here that I loaded this uh, schema into my demo database and there's some data. And that includes the names of all my friends here. Oh man, I'm not on the list. Oh, sorry, dude, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hey, note to self. <laughs> okay, so here we're gonna go back into Horizon, and we're gonna generate a backup on the MySQL uh, instance. So basically, as I mentioned earlier, so for backup we name it, and then um, we pick the instance we wanna backup. Right there, and we, we uh, give it a description, and now it's doing a backup. And you see it's building the backup, and then it'll, look at how fast that was. Wow. Oh. <laughs> and then there's a show on the backup, and here's the details of the backup, shows where the, the reference to Swift, where the backup ended up living. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna restore it to a new instance, I think. Is it running here? Yeah, it's still running. Oh, there we go, okay. So let's do a, so basically, restore is effectively overloaded into launch. So you would do launch instance, and instead of actually filling in all this stuff, you can do restore from backup. So I'm gonna make a B underscore MySQL database. Set the flavor and size, and then I'm gonna do that. Go over to restore from backup, pick the backup I just made, and do a launch. So it's gonna do all the normal things you'd expect in launch, and then it's gonna apply that backup out of Swift right onto that in instance. And watch how fast this is, it's incredible. <laughs> We should ship Camtasia with the product or something. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna go back into MySQL. This guy clicks really slow. He does. <laughs> so here's the, the Trove show on the, the, the uh, restored data, uh, data store uh, instance, sorry, the instance I just restored from. So I'm gonna connect now. You'll notice I believe the URL is... Yeah, uh, 0.4. 0.4, yeah. And magic, the tables are there and the data. <laughs> and I'm still not in the list. Oh. <laughs> okay, I think, I think that's all I was gonna show. Yeah, okay, so I think I just have one more slide, oops. So this is just, uh, so, so that was demo. Uh, I think I went through pretty much all the, all the, uh, the command line API and then the, the demo showed Horizon and some of the commands. Um, this is my second plug for Tesora. So <laughs> we're basically trying to, we're positioning ourselves as enterprise trove experts. The, definitely check out our website. And I hope you had a chance to see our booth at the show, um, which is now gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we have, we have some other materials on there that I hope you've, uh, everybody can have a chance to look at. So thanks a lot, Baz, for your help today. Thank and you. Uh, any questions? Not at the moment. So that's part of the clustering work that uh, Baz referred to earlier. So the, my, at this point, Mongo is a single instance, so it would be basically dev test to use case at this point. What is it? On the mic, I guess. Yeah. Can what we... Is, what does it, it take if to add we've, a, we've got questions, can y'all line up on the mic? What does it take to add uh, other DBMS platforms to the system? Like if I, if I wanted to add, say, FoundationDB or something, is that a matter of just creating a new agent for the 
for the guest that responds to, you know, manage the specific config variables for that platform, or is it more? Right, uh, so, so there's nothing that prevents you from creating a, a private implementation uh, of a data store. Um, we would love to have it in the public, and we would love to see it supported uh, so that other people can use it. But if it's a proprietary data store, or if it's something that, you know, to have an instance, you, it, you have to pay lots of money, uh, then absolutely, you just have to create the guest implementation and then do the same things that Doug showed on the installation by you know, telling it what the ver data store is, what the versions are, have a, an, an image with the data store preloaded into it, and then it's as simple as that. Hi, um, can you tell me, in the context of Trove, what the parameters that can be defined and tweaked are for the flavors? It's the, it's the same flavor, right? So there's a... Uh -huh, it's pulling directly from... So the there's standard. a couple things. There's a size, there's the size that the volume, the volume that the, the, uh, the image is gonna be loaded on. Right. And there's also a size that ultimately the resulting data, what's called data directory, right, which could end up, say, being on Cinder, for example. And then CPUs and, then the and memory. standard, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we actually, um, when, when you list flavors, we make a call out to uh, your uh, OpenStack Nova installation to see what the flavors are available there. And based on those flavors, when we go to install the data store, we make some decisions in the configuration files to give you X number of max connections to start or um, you know, other, other uh, memory type things. So if you start with a certain size and need to expand later, what's the workflow for doing that? That's so resize, yeah, right? yeah we, uh, we have a resize command that effectively, uh, depending on the implementation of what your uh, Nova infrastructure does, um, you could potentially resize in place and do a quick, um, it will edit, it edits the configuration files for you and ups those, those pieces that I talked about that uh, we kind of monitor. Um, and then it'll bounce uh, your data store instance for you. And that's already built in. Uh, that was, that's been around for... Um, well, I guess I could have demoed that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and optionally you can if you, you know, if you feel the need or you want to move the data to a different availability zone, um, we have scheduler hints that you can pass in as well. Um, or you can also do what Doug showed, the backup and restore. Sounds great, thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, where does the uh, data store actually reside? Is this all the uh, Cinder uh, block storage or other local so storage? So that's, that's configuration based. Uh, the operators can decide that. So you can, if, if you select a volume, then the data store will be s stored on a Cinder volume. Um, if you, some, some things like Redis don't need a, a backing data volume, so you can, that'll just be in memory on the VM itself. So it's, it's like all the other. You can use ephemeral, right? You can also do Right, you can also use ephemeral. So like, like the other OpenStack products, uh, we are uh, configuration based when you do an installation. And um, you know, that's where Doug's company can come in and kind of help out to plug those things, plug the right things in. So and if, if you have a larger uh, data size, then you can attach the, uh Cinder volume to it and then store it that way? Yeah, so if you're talking about, if you're importing data in just using MySQL um, or using whatever data store, uh, you, you as a customer will need to know what the data set size is. But if you go to do a backup and restore and you try to restore to a smaller instance, we actually store the size of the volume and the instance uh, so that you can't make a mistake and try to you know, restore 100 gigs of data onto a one gig drive. Uh, what are the uh, HA and DR uh, considerations on the design? The H, the, I'm sorry, was that HA? Yeah, HA, HA and DR. Okay, so um, we're, we're still working on those right now, right? Uh, we, uh, as I alluded to earlier, the vision of Trove involves talking about uh, you know, disaster recovery, f automatic failover, uh, those, those kind of things, we're, we're discussing them. And the first thing we're going to do is build the replication and clustering API out so that we have the ability to do those next uh, DR things. So HA will be coming as, uh, in Juno just based on the fact that we'll have a replication API. Now in terms of Trove itself, uh, the, like the installation of it, it's a, just like the rest of the uh, OpenStack products, you stand up multiple, um, multiple API nodes and multiple schedulers and multiple um, task managers in, in, in that aspect. So in fact, I think, we're, 
we're talking about failover at, at, at 1050 in Design Summit. Yeah, absolutely. So come on and join <laughs> us. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the Neutron support. So in the UI, I haven't seen that selection of a network. Or Can you, I think you had to drop the mic, I think. I've seen the uh, UI where there is no network selection. So what type of Neutron support uh, is planned, or is it already implemented? Like, if yep. I want to have a private network for this particular database. Yep, so Neutron is, is still new in Trove. So there's not, there's, uh, you know, I hate to say this, but I didn't work on it, so I can't tell you exactly what it is, but uh, there's two core developers that worked on it that, uh, that are at HP that, that can help you out with that. But they're using Neutron heavily, so they're building that support out as, as they need it. Right now, we can, in terms of, um, security groups, which may or may not really deal with that, you have the ability to set ports and security groups uh, in your installation. And that's about, that's about it at present. But at least I can select the, the private network by what I want to set in for a project. If there are multiple private networks in my project, will I be able to select one of those for my database instance today? I mean, with so, so the operators, uh, at, at present, that's an operator. Uh, uh, configuration parameter, but that's something that we're, we're building out if you have your own private network to be able to select that on creation time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, we got another one here, I think. What about support for Oracle, DB2, Sybase? Is that happening, or is it going to come? I mean, it's, I think uh, some of this stuff is based on what, what uh, demands is out there. So, for, you know, uh, and, and that, there was an earlier question about how, how can you build out a, a support for a new data store. So um, clearly, Oracle and DB2 are you know, obviously very mainstream databases. So I would expect that as Trove gets more traction, there will definitely be a need for those kinds of things. Yeah, we, we welcome um, individuals to come and help contribute those to the project. OK. Thank you, everybody, for your attention and time. All right, yep. <laughs>